Uh, thank you, David, and uh, thank you, uh, organizers, for this opportunity to talk here. I think for me, this is the first uh, offline talk uh, since uh, the two years of um, COVID. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about uh, differentiability of Lipschitz functions. And so, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Something is not working. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, as a motivation, I'm going to start with the Rademacher theorem, uh, which tells us, uh, of course, that uh, any Lipschitz mapping between finite dimensional spaces is differentiable almost everywhere with respect to Lebesgue measure. And so, if we look at the set where uh, this mapping is not differentiable, then it has measure zero. Uh, now, the very, a very natural question, which uh, which was asked long time ago, was, of course, now if we start with the set of measure zero, can we always find a function uh, which would have a set of points of non-differentiability, maybe exactly equal to n, or at least containing n? And um, uh, for the containing. Uh, uh, the answer is yes in case uh, of functions from R to R, and there are some variants of how one can prove this. Uh, but um, it turned out that, uh, uh, and uh, it was shown quite a long time ago now, more than 30 years ago by Price, that uh, already in the case when you look at real valued functions from Rn with n at least two, you can find sets uh, of Lebesgue measure zero, uh, which have the, the very special property that every Lipschitz function uh, defined on the whole space uh, will have points of differentiability in this fixed uh, set of measure zero. Uh, now I, I put a number of names here uh, because um, originally the construction um, that David uh, gave was uh, that he was considering any G delta set in Rn, which contained uh, a dense set of lines in a dense set of directions and uh, proved that this set will have this property. And later on, we started to call these sets universal differentiability sets. Uh, but then together, first together with Dore, uh, uh, we were able to, to construct uh, slightly better examples. Why are they better? Because if you take uh, Price's example, then the closure of the set will, of course, contain, will be the whole Rn. And uh, so we proved that uh, these universal differentiability sets, together with uh, the property of being now, uh, may be chosen to be compact. Uh, and um, of Hausdorff dimension one. And then uh, later on with diamond, uh, we constructed um, uh, examples of Minkowski dimension one, which, which was even smaller sets, still capturing points of differentiability of every real valued uh, Lipschitz function on Rn. Now, uh, the story uh, doesn't stop here. And uh, one would like to look at those sets that are not universal differentiability sets. So uh, we know that for such a set, there exists a Lipschitz function, real valued Lipschitz function, which has no points of differentiability inside that set. But uh, is it possible to have a non-universal differentiability set for which maybe many Lipschitz functions still have points of differentiability in this set. Of course, not every, but maybe majority, whatever this means. So yeah, so we are looking for non-UDS uh, such that there are many Lipschitz functions with points of differentiability inside that set. Okay, 
Now, uh, let me say a few words about non-UDS. Uh, what do we know about these sets? Uh, so we can see the subsets of Rn. Uh, now, of course, if uh, n is equal to one, then a set is a non-universal differentiability set if and only if it is Lebesgue now. But in uh, the situation n at least two, the situation is not that clear. Well, of course, it uh, has to be of Lebesgue measure zero. So this is uh, clear. Now, uh, I'm not going to, to go uh, into that and, and give definitions, but um, if S has the property of being porous or even sigma porous, which is countable union of porous sets, uh, then these are non-UDS. Uh, so one can construct Lipschitz functions which have no points of differentiability inside this. And so because of this, um, <clears throat> such sets uh, may have any Hauser dimension all the way up to and including the maximal one N. Uh, so they might be rather big in this sense, but if we know, if we have a set which uh, has Hauser dimension strictly less than one, uh, then it is a non-universal differentiability set. And I will explain this in a second because more generally, uh, if you take any set which is S prime times, uh, let's say zero one to the N minus one, uh, where S prime has Lebesgue measure zero, then this is an example of a non-UDS. Non you simply look at uh, the, uh, well, at the result for N equals one. And then this means that in the direction of this real line, you can have uh, uh, a function, we, Lipschitz function, which has uh, no derivatives inside the set. And so uh, you wouldn't have any directional derivatives uh, in that particular direction in, in this new set. Uh, okay. Uh, now, slightly uh, more, uh, we know uh, in, in that paper where we were constructing uh, uh, a universal differentiability set of uh, Minkowski dimension one, we actually proved uh, with, uh, with Michael Diamond that uh, if, uh, if one dimensional uh, Hausdorff measure of S is finite, then it must be non-UDS. But in general, unfortunately, there is no full geometric characterization of uh, either UDS or non-UDS to date. And so this is slightly problematic, and uh, uh, I will I will pick up on this uh, again later on in this talk. So uh, okay, so we are looking at uh, the situation when we have a non-universal differentiability set, but we hope to have many Lipschitz functions which have points of differentiability inside that set. And I would like to, to be more precise about this notion, many. So um, uh, I'm going to talk about typical Lipschitz functions. And uh, in order to do so, we need to define what a typical Lipschitz function or what uh, is a typical uh, object in a topological space. And for that, we involve bare category and uh, the notion of uh, uh, typical objects. So just very quickly, I run through, through the definitions. Uh, we say that a subset of a topological space is nowhere dense if its closure has empty interior. And then we have the first bare category um, if uh, the set is a countable union of nowhere dense sets. And uh, the complement, to the subset of first category is, uh, is called residual. And finally, any object from a residual subset is referred to as typical. So if we want to have a property that is satisfied for a typical object, we must find um, uh, a residual subset 
uh, such that for every object from this residual subset, the property is satisfied. Okay. Uh, so now, what kind of spaces are we going to consider? Uh, so uh, when considering, because I would like to talk about Lipschitz, um, Lipschitz functions, Lipschitz mappings, um, we will we will consider spaces um, uh, of uh, uh, of Lipschitz functions or mappings uh, with uniformly bounded constant uh, and um, let's say one uh, with the sup norm. And in the case when uh, we look, for instance, at real valued functions, uh, we will be looking at uh, mappings. Of course, we need, in order to talk about sup norm, we need to have them uh, bounded. So, uh, so we need to look at, uh, the, at, at a bounded uh, domain as well. Uh, similarly, uh, we, we will consider uh, more general uh, spaces uh, where we look at um, LIP1 uh, mappings from a subset of a Banach space to another Banach space, again with sup norm uh, where Q is bounded and closed. And finally, we can actually uh, do this for unbounded subsets, and in particular for um, leap one functions from X to Y, but then we will take uh, uh, here, in order to, to, to make sure that we get uh, bounded, um, uh, bounded norm, we take uh, such, uh, uh, such series where we restrict each time uh, domain to, to a bounded bull. Now, why do we do this? Well, in fact, uh, one can consider the space of all Lipschitz mappings uh, with, uh, with the Lipschitz constant being the norm. But this space uh, has much worse properties than the space, the, the kind of spaces that uh, I'm going to consider. So in particular, because we are talking about differentiability, it will be very important for us to look at those functions that are already differentiable. And in the space um, of all Lipschitz mappings with uh, lib f being the norm, um, this collection of, um, uh, of function or, or of mappings uh, which are differentiable everywhere, uh, it, it, it is a nowhere uh, nowhere uh, dense closed subset. So we can't use that subset in order to approximate our mappings. And so that's why uh, we're going to look at these spaces. Now, uh, for these spaces, uh, we, uh, we know that they're complete metric spaces and any complete metric spaces is a bare space. Uh, so that means that residual subsets are dense. So that's why we, um, we, we treat a uh, typical object as, uh, as an object uh, uh, that possesses certain properties that are shared by many, uh, many mappings in, in, in this case. So uh, for instance, uh, uh, these, these spaces, lib one, uh, and also continuous mappings with sup norm are bare spaces. Okay. Uh, so uh, it is a well known fact that uh, a typical continuous function uh, is actually nowhere differentiable. Uh, so, in other words, we can say that there is a residual subset of continuous functions. Uh, such that for every member of that residual subset uh, and every T, uh, F is not differentiable at T. So although we, uh, we know that it is possible to construct uh, this virus trust function um, explicitly, and uh, it is a continuous function which 
which is nowhere differentiable. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, once if you if you prove this, then you see that a typical continuous function is actually nowhere differentiable. Quite a spectacular fact. Now, of course, nothing like this may happen with the Lipschitz function because uh, they are differentiable. After all, it's uh, you know almost everywhere uh, with respect to Lebesgue measure, and uh, this may not happen if we replace the domain uh, with a universal differentiability set because uh, we know that uh, every Lipschitz function has a point of differentiability there. Uh, but returning to the question that I have already posed, uh, we are trying to answer this. Are there non-universal differentiability sets such that a typical Lipschitz function has a point of differentiability inside S? Okay. Uh, now, let's look again at, uh, at the one-dimensional one case. And um, uh, the following uh, theorem was, was proved uh, in a paper by Price and Tischer in 94. Uh, uh, so they proved the following characterization of subsets of uh, zero one. Uh, that a set is contained in an F sigma subset of zero one of Lebesgue measure zero. So we have uh, a countable union of closed uh, subsets of zero one with, uh, with a total measure zero. If and only if a typical leap one function is not differentiable on S. So for every uh, point T in S, F is not differentiable. And, uh, okay, and I'm going to call these sets typical non differentiability sets. Uh, and uh, the complement of this collection, uh, those sets that can't be covered by an F sigma uh, of Lebesgue measure zero, uh, these are precisely the sets. Uh, for which uh, uh, typical leap one functions have some points of differentiability inside. Now there is this technical condition uh, that when we talk about um, sets which can't be covered by F sigma, then, uh, and we, we will see this later on as well, uh, there are certain uh, statements coming from descriptive set theory which we need to use in order to, to get to some geometric properties of, uh, of the sets. And then uh, we are bounded to, to, um, to have this additional condition of being analytic. Um, okay, and we, we call these sets typical differentiability sets. Now, just looking at, at this statement, uh, I can already give you an answer in the one dimensional case for, uh, for the non-UDS. Uh, so if we consider something like this, uh, so uh, clearly this set is null. And so because it is a subset of R, it is non-UDS for uh, mappings from R to R. Uh, on the other hand, it is a G delta set, so it can't be covered by F sigma null. And so we get uh, automatically that it is a typical differentiability set. So we see that already in the case of uh, Lipschitz functions from R to R, there are non-UDS sets which uh, still have many functions, like almost every Lipschitz function has points of differentiability inside that set. Okay, now what should a higher dimensional analog uh, of this theorem be? So first of all, we must know that being coverable by F sigma null can't be the right condition in higher dimensions. Because already in the 
uh, in the paper with Doré, uh, we constructed uh, null subsets in Rn with n at least two, which are closed and universal differentiability sets. So uh, remember in the price t-shirt theorem, uh, a set which is a subset of F sigma null is a bad guy. So uh, here we see that we have very uh, nice sets actually, which, which are already closed and null. So uh, the role of bad guys in uh, high dimensional spaces is played by purely one and rectifiable sets. Uh, to be more precise, uh, these are uniformly purely unrectifiable sets. Let me give a definition and say a few words about these two notions. So a set is uh, purely unrectifiable if uh, its intersection with every C1 smooth curve um, has a uh, uh, house of one, um, the one, one dimensional measure zero. And uh, a set is uniformly uh, purely unrectifiable if uh, we can approximate this by open sets containing uh, the given set S. So, so we would like to have uh, uh, that for every epsilon, there is an open set, uh, an open neighborhood G epsilon, uh, such that for all uh, curves, now I'm, I'm not giving precise definitions, but we would like, uh, we, we wouldn't like these curves to, uh, to go like this. Uh, so we would like uh, these curves to go more or less in, in a certain direction. Uh, then the uh, H1 measure of the intersection should be less than epsilon. Now, of course, it's clear that uh, if you have a uh, uniformly uh, purely unrectifiable sets, then it is purely unrectifiable. Uh, the fact that uh, every purely unrectifiable uh, set is actually uniformly purely unrectifiable set uh, was stated in the result um, by Andrew Schmatter. And uh, now I don't, I don't recall, I think it's at least 10 years maybe or something like this. He stated it, he gave a number of seminars explaining ideas of the proof, but then this paper never appeared anywhere. So I just don't know whether this is true or not. I'm not going to use that. What is clear here is that if we have uh, a closed purely unrectifiable set, so um, if we're talking about uh, uh, Rn, so, so we have, let's say a compact, uh, purely unrectifiable set, then of course we can uh, prove that it is uniformly uh, purely unrectifiable. So this is the only thing I'm going to use. Now, uh, the following theorem was, was stated in, in two papers by Alberti, Czerny and Price. Uh, and it says that for every uh, uniformly purely unrectifiable set, there exists a Lipschitz function uh, which has no directional derivative at any points uh, in this set. Now, the proof of this theorem has never been published and we were waiting for it very long, but uh, a little by little, I mean, there, there were many very great results stated in those two papers. Some of these results appeared in, in various different papers, sometimes uh, in a stronger, um, formulation. And so this, this has happened with this theorem as well. So, um, so the following theorem uh, was proved in um, my joint paper with, with David Price in uh, um, 2017. Uh, so uh, so we, we proved uh, almost that, but uh, a bit uh, more quantifiable. So, so what we show is that if, uh, if you have a uniformly purely unrectifiable set, then one can construct one Lipschitz uh, uh, function f such that when you take 
uh, this ratio. Now, uh, we, we are taking supremum over all y in, uh, in the ball of radius r, but we are dividing here by r, not by the norm of y. Uh, then this limit is equal to zero at every point x in P. And uh, I will give you now a little bit more information, which uh, you don't need to remember at all, but uh, just to get a flavor of, of things, because then I'm going to, to refer to this. So we show, moreover, uh, while, while we are proving this, that um, if we fix any direction E and uh, some parameter eta, uh, then uh, we can find uh, another Lipschitz function G uh, close to, to, this, uh, uh, to this F uh, uh, such that uh, in fact, uh, close to that function G, any Lipschitz function uh, H will have somewhat similar properties uh, to that. So not only that, this function f uh, has uh, this uh, uh, strong non-differentiability, but also if you go slightly, uh, so, so this, this parameter eta, uh, you have to think as, as something small. So uh, you can uh, step arbitrarily, make an arbitrarily small step from f, and then there will be neighborhood around that function g uh, where uh, those Lipschitz functions H will also demonstrate certain degree of non-differentiability, so to speak. Or you, you, can, you can say, well, they will demonstrate differentiability as if their derivative is equal to E, but, but the thing is that we, um, we can start with every E. So you will have uh, radii around X um, on which you see the gradient going in completely different directions. Anyway, we, we will see later on uh, why this matters. Uh, uh, let me tell you uh, something about uh, the high dimensional result and the dichotomy uh, that uh, we prove. So we, we prove that uh, indeed, if we look at a set um, which is contained in an F sigma purely unrectifiable uh, set, then uh, this happens if and only if when the typical lip one function is differentiable at no point of S, and these are typical non-differentiability sets. And moreover, in this case, these uh, typical lip one functions uh, will have no directional derivatives. And uh, in the complementing case, uh, um, a set uh, can't be covered by F sigma purely unrectifiable if and only if the typical leap one function is fully differentiable at some point in S. Now, uh, 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 first of all, we can, uh, uh, we can say something about non-UDS, uh, uh, typical differentiability sets in, uh, in all Rn with n at least two. So we simply start with the set that we have already looked at and we multiply it by uh, zero one to the n minus one. Uh, so uh, this set is clearly non-UDS. We, we talked about this, uh, but again, it's a G delta set. So can't be covered by F sigma purely unrectifiable and so it is a typical differentiability set. Um, okay, now some more remarks that uh, I would like to make. Uh, it is, uh, if, if we think about <coughs> um, only analytic subsets, then it is enough to prove just forward directions in both parts and uh, uh, a priori, if you think uh, a set may have exactly one of typical differentiability or typical non-differentiability non or none. 
because if you don't have, uh, for instance, if you don't have typical differentiability, it only means that uh, uh, the collection of functions uh, which are differentiable somewhere in S uh, is not residual, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, it is a complement to, uh, to a residual subset. But uh, this uh, theorem shows that none is impossible, basically. Uh, the other thing that uh, I want to mention is that there is a, this, there is a result by Merlot uh, who gets results similar to this theorem, but for mappings from uh, 0, 1 to n to Rm, uh, where m is at least n, uh, there are some differences and I, I will mention something more uh, later on in this uh, talk as well. But uh, the main uh, difference is that it proves existence of directional derivatives only. Now, one may think that uh, because we can see the mappings uh, from Rn to R, so you could possibly take uh, the, the collection that we have, take this point of, of uh, differentiability and, um, and just uh, for these functions, you can take the, the first, uh, you can take one of the directions and, and just uh, look in, in that. But in fact, uh, the, the relation between those two collections of, uh, of lip functions or lip uh, mappings is not that clear. Uh, and uh, we we haven't we haven't understood that to 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 the very bottom yet. Uh, for instance, uh, one may of course consider the standard projection uh, from the collection of uh, uh, lip lip one mappings from uh, R n to R m to let's say the first coordinate, which will be lip one function from R n to R. But it turns out that a residual set in, uh, in the latter may have a pre-image which is nowhere dense in, in that space. So, so they are not related in, in any uh, nice way because these are different spaces. And uh, well, uh, you may just think that if you, if you start with the, with the function, real valued function, uh, which has Lipschitz constant one, it is not uh, very clear how to uh, to top it to to something that that goes into R M and which has lip one constant. Anyway, uh, I'm just saying that at the moment uh, these two results sit uh, somewhat independently. Yes, yes. Uh, well, th there is one ingredient which I'm going to talk about, which. Uh, which is a kind of general thing which is used in both, but uh, apart from that, the constructions are completely different. Um, okay, so, uh, so the ingredients that uh, I'm going to talk about is, uh, is how to prove that a certain subset of, um, of a topological space is residual. Uh, for this, uh, it is useful to use uh, um, to use a, a game, which is called banach mazur game. And uh, this is defined as follows. So the banach mazur game has two players, player one, player two. Uh, and uh, um, they start uh, by fixing a target set A. And then they open uh, on each step, they choose non-empty open subsets of the typological space. Uh, according to the following rule. So first player one chooses some open subset, then um, player two chooses subset of uh, U1, and then player one chooses subset of what uh, player two has just chosen and so on. And uh, uh, the aim of player two is to guarantee that the intersection of all of these sets that uh, they defined uh, is a subset of the target set A, which was fixed uh, at the very start. And the aim of player one is to prevent this from happening. 
so um, uh, the the main theorem that uh, we are using is that uh, a subset of a topological space is residual if and only if player two has a winning strategy. And so then, in order to prove that something is residual, the technique is to define this banach mazur game and to win it, basically. And then this proves that the target set that you started with uh, is residual. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, of course, have time to, to talk about uh, how we're, we are doing this. Uh, just uh, maybe a small remark that um, winning strategy for, for the second player in a metric space, we can reduce this to only uh, defining balls around objects. And uh, uh, really very quickly, I will show you that uh, the non-differentiability thing uh, actually rather easily follows from that theorem uh, um, in, in the joint paper with Price um, when, when you use all, all the right bits about uh, balls around uh, uh, Lipschitz uh, functions. So the idea is, Okay, first of all, it's enough to prove this for closed purely unrectifiable uh, sets because uh, if you have a countable union, then uh, basically for each of the closed ones, you're going to have residual subset of functions. So you intersect uh, countably many residual subsets, you get a residual subset. Uh, so P is a closed purely unrectifiable set. So it is a uniformly purely unrectifiable set. And so we can uh, use that theorem and not only the theorem itself, but uh, this uh, kind of intricate construction that we have there. So if we start with the target set to be the collection of those lib one functions, uh, uh, which don't have any, uh, any directional derivatives and we play this banach mazur game, then uh, what player two has to do, first of all, make sure that this intersection of balls is just a single Lipschitz function. Now this is elementary. You just uh, make sure that the radius uh, of the ball tends to zero. Uh, uh, but then you use that statement uh, with, with many constants uh, uh, in order to make sure that this unique intersection H sees uh, slopes in, uh, in any direction. So you, you fix uh, some countable dense subset of the unit sphere and uh, um, on different uh, scales of smallness, you will see different, uh, um, different um, uh, gradients. So, so you get the non-differentiability. Yeah, uh, the, the differentiability part is, is actually much more <laughs> involved and, and interesting, but um, I will just skip it and, and won't talk about this because there is something else that uh, I, I wanted to talk about. And, uh, and this is uh, uh, about how many of those points of differentiability that uh, F has inside, um, let's say, inside a typical differentiability set. Maybe I will just say, um, very briefly, what we do that uh, when uh, when a set is um, when when a set can't be covered, uh, then uh, we first use um, this um, uh, descriptive set theory results in order to uh, to construct a very special curve that uh, somehow goes through the set that we have. Uh, and uh, we, we make it so that in many points where uh, of the intersection of this curve with the set, I mean, this set not necessarily con contains any curves, to be honest, but, but of course uh, there will be some intersection so, so that we can guarantee that uh, in many points where uh, the curve, um, the points on the curve happen to be in the set as well. 
uh, the curve is differentiable and uh, it has, uh, um, uh, well, we, we parameterize it so that the derivative has magnitude one. And then we find uh, a point of differentiability of F at, uh, at one of such points. But uh, in the construction itself, there is, uh, uh, well, the, the, there are actually two banach mazur games, one uh, inside the other somehow. And the uh, impression, the initial impression we had was as if we could get uh, uh, residually many points of uh, differentiability inside such sets. But, but then it turned out that actually the opposite is true. And so uh, what, uh, what we proved is, is the following. First of all, let's consider the most general situation when we have any two Banach spaces, X, Y, a closed bounded subset um, with a non-empty interior because we would like uh, to look at questions of how well uh, functions will be differentiable on subsets of this interior. We would like to guarantee that we, we can move in all of the directions inside Q. Uh, and we define the set DF of X to be the collection of all linear operators which act like a derivative at, uh, at the point X. In the spirit of that uh, paper, with, with price, but this time, uh, so, so again, uh, we're dividing by R here, but uh, so we, we take the length of the supremum of the whole ball uh, of radius R around X here. Uh, now, of course, if uh, F is genuinely differentiable at a point, then uh, this set will, con will consist of just one point. Uh, um, but uh, um, it may happen that uh, um, this, this set is, is not as nice. So uh, the known results I would like to mention uh, are like this. So first of all, th there was a paper by Leon Wong uh, in uh, 2000, um, which says that um, uh, for every finite dimensional X, a typical uh, one Lipschitz real valued function has empty Dini subgradient for residually many X. So I will define this Dini subgradient, but uh, I won't go into details. I will simply say that uh, this Dini subgradient being empty implies that F is not differentiable at X. The other one is uh, from the same uh, paper by Merlo. It says that in the case when um, we have a subset uh, of Rn, uh, which is typical non-differentiability set, uh, then for a typical leap one mapping to Rm, um, uh, for every point from the set and uh, for every direction, you could, uh, you could find all, all possible um, um, all possible gradients if, if you move in that. But, but uh, uh, with the caveat that uh, this is just uh, um, for each E, there exists a, a sequence like this. Now, what we show in, uh, in this situation is that in fact, uh, for every separable subspace of the uh, of the space of linear operators from X to Y, there is a residual uh, subset of uh, leap one functions or leap one mappings uh, to Y, uh, such that for every mapping uh, from this collection, the set of points where this DF contains the whole ball, so everything, absolutely everything is residual in G. So uh, this uh, F will, of course, be very badly non-differentiable at this point. Uh, now, I will make some remarks, and this will be the end of my talk. Uh, so first of all, uh, 
why separable? Uh, this is simply because this df is always separable. So uh, we can't go beyond that. Uh, second, of course, one of uh, very interesting cases is the case between finite dimensions when everything is separable. So basically we can get here uh, all the ball, the whole, uh, the whole ball of, uh, of all of the linear operators from uh, uh, Rn to Rm. Well, of course, of, of, uh, um, of uh, norm less than or equal to one. Uh, now, uh, for each uh, set S, then we get that a typical F from Rn to Rm, leap one, uh, is going to be non-differentiable at a typical point X and in the maximal possible way. So this, for example, includes all typical differentiability sets and even such nice sets as the whole zero one to the end. So you take a cube, you know that every Lipschitz function is differentiable almost everywhere, but you actually, this, this tells you that it is going to be non-differentiable at a typical point in the maximal possible way. Uh, now, if, uh, if S is a typical non-differentiability set, uh, we, we get that uh, a typical uh, one leap F is non-differentiable at residually many S, and uh, we, it, it is still work in progress uh, to show that, uh, uh, in fact, it is going to be non-differentiable at uh, all S in the sense of this. So not only residually many, but at all. So uh, something uh, like in, uh, in Merlo's result on the previous slide, but uh, now this is going to be uniformly on, on the balls uh, around uh, every point. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you.